Um, well, good morning. Um, my name is Kevin, Kevin Vaughan Smith. I know many of you have joined us on previous uh, in this series of, of web seminars, and we're delighted you've been able to join us again. Uh, just to remind you that these are recorded sessions. Uh, we will send you all a copy, but they're also made available to other people, so just bear that in mind. Um, with me today, of course, is my colleague Stuart, Stuart Meister, but we're also thrilled to be joined by three global experts in ecosystems from as far apart as Singapore, Dubai, and London. And I'll be introducing those folks in, in a little bit more detail shortly. But let me just talk about what we're gonna cover. Um, together, we're gonna to talk about what is an ecosystem and why do they get created? What is it that's driving the formation of these things? And we're going to try and make this discussion as practical as possible so you can take away some really good ideas about what you can do about it if you choose to adopt that process. So the first half of the session, and the session is scheduled for an hour today, it, we'll hear from our experts. And in the second half, we're gonna open it up. Three ways that you can get involved in that discussion. Uh, first of all, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a raised hand um, issue, uh, button rather. Please just hit that. And we can then open up your mic and you can talk into the group and, and that's great. And we'd love this to be uh, interactive. The second is if you'd like to share something with the whole group, there is a, a chat box uh, that you can use at the bottom of the screen. And finally, if you want to ask one of the panelists something, there's a Q&A facility. So please do make this as interactive as possible. Enjoy the session. But Stuart, perhaps you'll kick us off uh, why are we doing this? Why are we interested in ecosystems? Well, if we can all think back at what feels like about 100 years, but is about three months ago, to when life was relatively normal, whatever normality looks like, everyone, almost every kind of organization, said they uh, were going to do the same thing. They were going to be agile, responsive, resilient, uh, consultative, purpose-led, relationship-led. And everyone said all of that, but actually, if you looked at most organizations, mostly they did not achieve those, uh, those outcomes they, they planned to. And we think one of the, re the reasons for that was that they were highly transactional in the short term and failed to be collaborative. Now, if, as some people say, COVID is accelerating history, then we're suggesting that the acceleration should consciously be towards those sorts of outcomes. And I read a really interesting article the other day uh, featuring Sam Rushton. He said, we're in the age of anything can happen. I thought it was a great phrase. So if we're in the age of anything can happen, the need to be responsive, agile, innovative, purpose-led, uh, consultative, not transactional, is ever more important. And we th we're here to say that we think that ecosystems is could be a, a, a center, a, a powerful centerpiece of that strategy. Let me just explain our thinking this, then, then, then we're going to uh, hear the views of our, of our distinguished guests. Anyone who's seen any of our web seminars in the past few weeks knows that this is the journey that we suggest uh, it should be at the core of the strategy. So moving from commodity to partner. Now that goes for whether we're talking about your customers, um, in other words, particularly key accounts, if you're in business to business, investing your time in uh, high value customers and creating more value together in a partnerial way is the right way to go. Everyone makes more money, everyone creates more value. The whole thing works better. But also when it, if looking the other way to your suppliers, your supply chain, your partners, associates, deciding consciously to invest relationship capital in powerful partners and suppliers and doing so in a way that's collaborative, not simply transactional. Now, the thing about ecosystem thinking is that it combines both of those into one set of ideas, both looking one way to customers, the other way to suppliers and partners. Eco thinking ecosystem brings it all together into one uh, big idea and, and drives how you behave, the, the values you have, the purpose you demonstrate, and your ability to be resilient and react and be agile and innovative. And all of those things goes up if you do this right. And that's what we want to talk about over the next hour. So that time, I think, to, to hear from the people who, from, our, from our guests on this, Kevin. Oh, Kevin's gone mute. Go mute on us, Kevin. 
What I think, thank you. What I think you'll hear from our three guests is there are common themes uh, around ecosystems which are driving them, although they are applied in very different ways. So let's hear about some of those. The first guest I'd like to call is Arno. Professor Arno de Meyer, <clears throat> uh, delighted to say that Arno's just written a great book. In it, he describes a number of things, but primarily the thing that jumped out of me were the seven principles that you need to have in place to create an ecosystem. So uh, Arno's been a professor at Judge Business School in Cambridge. He's uh, helped set up INSEAD in Asia, and he now is part of the LKCS School of Business in Singapore. Uh, joins us from Singapore. In fact, Arno, tell us, from your perspective, um, what is an ecosystem and why are they being created? Thank you. My, first of all, um, a great day to everybody who is listening to this uh, um, seminar or webinar. And uh, you may not know this, but today is actually a holiday in Singapore because we are celebrating VTEC Day. So if there are any Buddhists uh, among our audience, I wish them a great day. Um, but uh, my interest in ecosystems started uh, actually when I was still in Cambridge and I saw how these entrepreneurial companies around the University of Cambridge in the UK were sort of organized in a loose connected uh, network. It wasn't a market whereby people were constantly negotiating with each other and carrying out transactions that were uh, and where the coordinating principle was price. It wasn't a hierarchy of organizations that were in a very tight uh, controlled system, but it was this loose um, network of individuals and businesses that actually worked together to create value. And so looking at this and some of the other examples that you describe in the book all over the world, for me, there are three characteristics of an, an, an ecosystem. That is, first of all, it's about creating value. There must be somewhere a customer or a group of customers that will have a benefit from what the ecosystem is doing. Secondly, it is, as I said, that sort of loose um, network of uh, individuals sometimes, uh, businesses, uh, startups, whatever, that work together, not necessarily in a very uh, strong contractual uh, agreement with each other, uh, where, where, where they actually can go in and out of the ecosystem if they want to. And the third characteristic is that in order to achieve the, um, the value for that ultimate customer, they probably need to align their investments, uh, their learning, so that they have to co-align and co-evolve their role and their investment. Now, why do I think it's such a powerful uh, way of organizing, especially today, uh, when we are, as uh, you mentioned, when we sort of see a, an accelerator of many of the trends that were already there before. And it's first of all, because you do a lot of joint learning. As a small or even, even medium-sized company, you cannot know everything, everything. And if you can get together in a group of uh, like-minded uh, organizations, individuals, you're gonna do joint learning. And because you then have that access to information and data uh, and knowledge, you actually be, uh, will become um, faster in innovating. And it's sort of that joint learning to innovate that I see as what well is the first important characteristic of an ecosystem. Secondly, um, it's for me also an opportunity to scale up. Actually, quite a few of the examples we use in the book like Alibaba in China or Amazon Web Services or even Arm in, uh, in uh, Cambridge or The Guardian uh, when it made its major uh, changeover to become a very popular news website, uh, when you see how they do it, they do it in an ecosystem, but it enables them to scale up very rapidly. They don't need to have all the resources to do the scaling up in a vertically integrated uh, firm. They can go much faster. In particular, the case of Alibaba is very, very impressive in how they were able to scale up in, let's say, 15 years to one of the biggest uh, online retailers in the world. And thirdly, it's of course a much more flexible way of organizing. Um, uh, you can actually, in that loose network that you have, you can let people go. I mean, if some of the contributors don't uh, pull their weight uh, and actually are free riding on the ecosystem, you can actually ask them to leave uh, or you let them go uh, simply. You can bring in new partners if you think that you uh, need to have access on, uh, to new types of knowledge. But 
Then my third point that I wanted to make, and then I stop here, that is to say, when I define what that loose network is, what I can do with it, how do you make it work? Now, in the book, we spend a lot of time on that, but uh, uh, in a lot of words, uh, but I would say the key word here is trust. The coordinating mechanism that you have in an ecosystem is the trust. So if you want to build an ecosystem, and by the way, we are all in ecosystems. Ecosystems are around us. It's not something that is alien to this world. The commons in medieval uh, um, uh, cities and, and, and townships in the United Kingdom or in England were uh, ecosystems. Uh, so ecosystems are all around us. The point is, you need to actually start looking at how can I use the ecosystem to achieve my goal, creating more value, something that I couldn't do alone. Um, that, that's if you want terrific. to do that, you have to build trust. Alan, that's, that's terrific. Thank you. And I know that we're already getting points made that we'll come back to later. But Vera, you've, uh, uh, let me introduce Vera uh, Futsajansky. Uh, Vera, who's part of the working group at the World Economic Forum on Ecosystems and, and Platforms. And as part of being, as, as well as being part of that uh, great group, Vera's had practical experience at setting up ecosystems in Russia, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Vera, let me ask you the same question. From your perspective, what is an ecosystem and why are they being created? First of all, thank you so much, Kevin and Stuart, for having me. I love this discussion. I think ecosystems are essential. In fact, um, I think developing a thriving ecosystem should be at the center of any debate on economic development. I think it's, it's really important, especially now with this whole new reality. I think it's... Um, it's the startups really that will bring more creativity. So when I think about ecosystem, I really look at it from more um, an entrepreneurial perspective, right? Especially because you mentioned my background of having built accelerators and ecosystems in the region. So for me, it's more of um, an ecosystem as a unique environment that um, is conducive for the creation and growth for scalable and um, sustainable companies. So that's what I think when I think of ecosystems. And for that, all the, um, we need a support system around it. So Brett Feld um, um, speaks about it very well in his book as well. He wrote a book on building ecosystems, I think in 2012, um, and it still applies today. I think it's super essential and he, call them, he calls them feeders. So I think it's really important when we speak about an ecosystem to have the support system in place. and. Um, those feeders or the support system is um, the government, <coughs> right? I mean, to have government regulations that um, give support to startups to try out new, um, new ways of uh, building products, you know, be it creating sandboxes for fintech startups in different parts of the world. Or um, when I was with Dubai government, we actually created, uh, we built a Dubai Future Accelerators and Dubai even that we're offering ourselves as a testing lab, you know, for startups to come and test the products and technology on the ground. Because many times um, companies or startups, they don't succeed just because they can't test the product. So, you know, this alignment of regulation <coughs> is very, um, helpful to have that in place. Then corporates, you know, in that same circle of ecosystem, corporates are important because um, they in the end become the partners for the startups. Academia is really important because that's what the talent grows and, um, and investors, because startups need money in order to, um, to grow and scale, right? So investors are really essential. And plus, I mean, mentorship is very important to what Arno said, I agree, you know, you need trust and an ecosystem has to be very welcoming as well. So there's nobody that um, we, can't, we can't be saying, you can be part of the ecosystem, you cannot. So it's about creating a welcoming environment and I think what's also really important to keep in mind is that an ecosystem doesn't grow overnight, right? It takes years to grow. I mean, the Silicon Valley ecosystem took um, decades to grow. So that's also a very important point to always um, keep in mind. Yeah, well, I can see. Uh, Vera, thank you so much. And uh, as we said at the start, it's a very different perspective, but equally of some commonalities. The one thing that jumped out from both uh, yourself and from Arno so far is, is trust, which brings me to... Our third guest, uh, Richard Anderson. Um, Richard was chairman of the um, uh, Risk Institute. Uh, I think he describes himself as a, an almost recovered ex-auditor, which is nice. Uh, but
but he brings a, a fascinating um, view to ecosystems because he sees risk and the way we manage risk as something which is going to change. And Richard, um, I know you're going to challenge us on our whole perception of risk and, and, and what that means in the future. So let me pose the question to you as well. What, from your perspective as an ecosystem, and, and why are they important? Thank you. Uh, Kevin? Yes, yes, sorry, I was just uh, making sure that I was, I, I was uh, uh, there. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I did remember your name. Uh, but what a great, what a great virtual uh, extended enterprise we are on this panel today. Uh, so I, I came into this, uh, this whole uh, area of thinking um, really back in the, the mid 90s when I was thinking about risk management. Uh, and, and we have a discipline that I'm sure you're all familiar with, enterprise risk management. And it seemed to me to be barking mad that we stopped at the boundaries of our organizations. And so I started to talk many years ago about extended enterprise risk management. But then um, uh, rather more recently, when I was chair of the Institute of Risk Management, uh, I, I, I got involved in a, a thought leadership piece that looked at uh, complex organizations in the 21st century. And um, uh, so the, the first point was a definitional one. What on earth do we mean by uh, uh, complex organizations in the 21st century? And it was really extended enterprises, ecosystems, uh, systems thinking around a joint enterprise of uh, two or more organizations um, which may be linked together by formal or by informal uh, 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 arrangements, uh, all focused on um, a particular objective. And, and one of the uh, facets uh, at the time that I was exploring um, was uh, that, that many of these component parts may be in different geographies. And actually, uh, as we go through COVID-19 uh, today, uh, that was more prescient than I thought. Uh, and in, in response to uh, Gary's uh, question on the chat, it very much is uh, about joint outcomes. So it doesn't have to be for profit. It may be for profit, it may be not for profit. Indeed, I, I am a, a, an INED, uh, an independent non-executive director on um, a, a large ecosystem that is entirely not-for-profit within the financial services world. And I think that when we're looking at these, these complex organizations, we should be looking at several uh, uh, attributes. So who holds the power in the relationships? It's not necessarily the biggest party. It may be the one with the most unique particular attribute that they can bring to it. You need to understand who, what, what are the incentives? Who is, who is getting what from it? And what are the regulatory influences? But very much uh, in common with Anu and Vera, uh, at the end of the day, I, I don't describe it as trust. I describe it as shared values, which I believe underpin trust. Um, so how do we make sure that there is a sense of shared values? I, I was encouraged uh, when I was originally organizing this piece of thought leadership for the IRM to describe it as uh, supply chain risk. It's not supply chain risk. It's not unidirectional. It's much more uh, complex uh, because it goes through your IP partners, your manufacturing outsourcing, your, uh, your suppliers, of course, your customers, your regulators. Uh, and indeed into the societies where you're operating. So uh, the, the final aspect for me is that this all needs uh, a, a sense of appropriate governance structures, which will be very different to a traditional uh, board of directors and the role of the directors in looking at the systemic risk management that sits within these ecosystems is very different. Richard, uh, that's, that's, uh, and all of these comments have, have sparked up lots of lots of different thoughts and we're going to come back to them but just before we do Stuart do you want to perhaps talk about some of the principles that we see involved in this yeah thank you we'll do and actually um Gary on your comment great thank you for for making the point that this isn't just about commercial enterprises and Richard's just reinforced that point there in his comments 
Um, I, I, you shouldn't really talk too much, as much about broader stakeholder groups as just suppliers and customers. It's a great correction. It absolutely applies to all sorts. And here, of course, you've been talking about very much public interest ecosystems as much as commercially focused ecosystems. So I think that's it's a very good point. I want to make sure we do we do capture it. So what we want to talk get into now is what, what you do about this stuff. How how do you how do you build ecosystems? What do you need to do? And in order to frame this section of discussion, I want to share with you all, for those that have not been on any of our seminars before, this is a, a core mutual value model that we use. Now the guys have just been talking about trust. Actually, this is our trust model. We think there are three dimensions to trust, which are there on the screen. But these are also the three dimensions potentially to an ecosystem. And I, I, I value the comments on it. But just to spell out what we mean by that, that, that essentially clarity is all about having an agreed vision. We know what we're trying to do together, a shared purpose, uh, and um, being clear or really defining the other two dimensions to this model very clearly and, and ideally you're even writing it down so everyone's, uh, everyone understands the definitions and is signed up to them. The second dimension there is capability. So if we're talking about an ecosystem, what, are we, what should we be capable of together that we're not capable of separately? How are we going to collectively do more than would otherwise be the case? And what does that look like in, in broad terms? And also in terms of capability, how capable are we going to be to respond, react uh, when things, you know, the re when things go wrong? How, what, how, what are our capabilities there? Having this stuff thought through consciously builds resilience and dynamism, innovation into the system. But the final dimension that very few people often address, we, in our view, in all sorts of commercial relationships, because people talk about what we're going to do and how much we're going to charge for it, but it. The third dimension is critical, the behaviors that we're all going to demonstrate and that we're going to be accountable for in the relationship that we're going to build and that we're going to describe up front. When we do this work, we've got a whole bunch of principles that we get people to really discuss and define in the context of that um, situation. And it's really important to have that codified. So if I may uh, come back to our guests, and if I may start with you, Richard, but taking those three dimensions, clarity, capabilities, character in mind, what do you think people need to do in order to develop a successful ecosystem? What, what would be your advice there? So um, uh, all of those are a, a different, uh, if you like, a different optic into the uh, ecosystem to the one that I, I've described. Uh, you, you, can, you can match. Uh, by looking into the ecosystem from different directions. Um, uh, to me, uh, the, the, the really critical issues um, which will map into there are uh, having absolute clarity on what it is that you're trying to achieve. Unless you have absolute clarity on what you're uh, trying to achieve, uh, there is little chance of an ecosystem working then each participant needs to understand from their own perspective, where does the power sit? Who can actually change the rules of this game? And uh, are they going to change them unilaterally for themselves or for the creation of mutual uh, value, if I can spin your name? Uh, pleasure, uh, pleasure, anytime, use it as much as you like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I think uh, it, it's, it's one, one of the uh, keys to understanding uh, all of these components is also going to be about uh, the incentives, who's taking what from this, from this. And it's not always money. Uh, it may be strategic, it may be power, it may be glory, it may be any number of things, uh, the, the sort of things that uh, John Adams, uh, Professor John Adams talked about in terms of uh, what are the benefits of taking risk. Uh, and and um, all, all of your capability, your characteristics, and all the rest of it are going to be heavily influenced by the regulatory influences, uh, which, which may be diverse. You know, the, the, the regulators in the UK, in the States, in Europe, in uh, Dubai, uh, in Singapore, may all take totally different views as to how certain parts of the... Uh, that are resident in their locations, how they might take part or, or, or how that might impact 
further uh, around the organization. Um, but, but the key to making these things work is absolutely making sure that you've got shared values. If you don't have shared values, it will not work. And I think that is the essence of what Anu and Vera are talking about in terms of trust. Right. Well, I just can echo the point that uh, mm -hmm. Richard is making, and I'll keep it brief, but um, mm -hmm. I think two, three points that he made are very key. That is, when you create an ecosystem, or not create, but use an ecosystem to achieve your goals as a group of, of organizations, you must have absolute clarity about what you want to do. And you need to translate in a very practical way. You have to have probably roadmaps. Uh, of where you want to go. You need to come together, communicate a lot, make it clear to partners why it is valuable to them to join uh, the, uh, the ecosystem. The other thing that I would like to emphasize is that I agree with Richard that the outcomes are not necessarily monetary. As it happens, the case studies we have looked at are all business case studies. So we look at money uh, and how you monetize your contribution to the ecosystem. You need to find a way to make that very fair where all partners in the ecosystem feel that they get a fair share of the uh, value that is actually created. And the final point uh, to just uh, reinforce what, he, uh, what Richard said is, um, you need to be able to manage across the organization. You talked about these capabilities and the character, and it's probably a little bit a combination of both, uh, Stuart, uh, but that is that an ecosystem requires a very different way of leading uh, because you're gonna have to lead people that are outside your organization and over which you have no power whatsoever, no authority, uh, where you have actually no incentives perhaps to, uh, to motivate them. You still have to engage them. You still have to motivate them. You have to make them enthusiastic to contribute to the ultimate goal of the ecosystem. That actually requires quite a different type of leadership. Can, can I, I just comment or, or ask for your comment on that, Arnu? There's, there's a definition of, of uh, moral authority uh, yeah. and that seems to be what you're implying rather than just uh, the power. It's moral authority. In some cases we've seen, uh, when we wrote a case on, on a French software producer, Dassault System, which is the second biggest soft software company in, in, in Europe. Uh, there it is actually the enthusiasm of the, the CEO of Dassault System, but also his technical competence. He is seen by all the other ones in the ecosystem as a competent leader. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's the moral authority, but also comp uh, leadership that comes from your competence and your vision. Do you know what's interesting about that? Uh, come to you in a moment, Vera and May, but what's really interesting about that is it plays also to the idea of the organization, the individual company as an ecosystem. Because I think there's no question that the style of leadership that works even within your own organization has a lot in common with what you just described. Some people talk about eco-leadership, as you may know. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, that, that those, those same, it, it, again, it comes back to the idea of consistent behaviors across all of the different stakeholder groups, internally and externally. And I think that's a very powerful point. Vera, if I can come to you, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you in a moment if I may. Vera, okay. what are your thoughts on what you've heard and your own perspective on, on this? I'd like to comment on the clarity comment that um, you introduced and Anna and Richard um, emphasized as well. I very much agree it's important to have clarity. However, in those times right now, we saw that um, it's important to have clarity, but maybe even more important is to have adaptability, right, and flexibility, because things can change so fast, faster than we even expect. I think there's a quote by Darwin who said, um, was it those who survive are not the strongest or the most intelligent, but uh, the ones most adaptable to change. So I think this adaptability to change is really key now. And no matter what ecosystem you, you work, whether it's the ecosystem in your sense of an organization or the ecosystem in my sense that I was presenting more on the entrepreneurial side. So, and I see that a lot also with um, startups and, and companies now pivoting, you know, so adapting to change is essential at the moment, because if you don't, um, you pretty much die. You can't survive right now because things have changed so much and so fast. You know, if you were in healthcare or delivery or, uh, you know, gaming industry, great, you know, your, your shares went up and you're doing well. But um, if you were, um, if you had a physical restaurant or, um, you know, something that requires people to go out, entertainment, for example, I mean, you are really suffering. So, 
being able to adapt to this change, I think is really critical. And that goes in line with your, I think, capability point, Stuart, as well. You know, that, you know, having this capability, having the talent to be able to adapt is really important. Um, I can give one example, actually, I thought was really interesting by an American company that used to build um, uh, uh, for festivals, they built kind of those little houses for festivals and they adapted very quickly and started building hospitals. I mean, this is an amazing adaptability and, and change share perspective, you know, from knowing they won't have any festivals this year anymore, they won't have any people that won't be able to sell tickets. They adapted and they built um, outdoor tents for hospitals. So thinking, you know, in that way, being able to cut when necessary, because also there isn't much funding now out there. Investors are being super careful. Um, it's very difficult to raise, you know, you need, a, you need to be ready for a long runway, you know, the, to be able to um, kind of, uh, you know, use the cash you have now. I don't want to get too much into this. I understand it's, it's a different, my kind of startup uh, view on things is different from the organizational view on things. I want to make one last comment, uh, something that Richard said on governance, I think is super important. And I'm really happy to see, I think things are changing for the better in terms of ESGs, you know, the environmental social governance. I think we see a big change. Um, corporates that um, had a high ESG score, I think are performing better now um, than many of those who didn't actually look into that. And I think that will be even more essential going forward. So I think we will be paying more attention to the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, to which we're all committed you know, to be solving that by 2030. And all, I mean, corporates and governments, and hopefully also many of us as individuals. So I think um, this whole COVID-19 situation brought a lot of thinking on um, how do we not only adapt to this change, but actually you know, live more sustainable going forward, not just as individuals, but also on a corporate level perspective. So I, I, see, I see a big um, kind of, uh, rise for the ESGs on corporate level. Thank you for that. And uh, we'll, we're gonna to come to some questions just in a moment, but Arno, I get the point actually that clarity, but uh, the ability to change and pivot is also very important. So it is a key thing here. Arno, I cut across you. Let me let me invite you to come in, and then we'll go to some of the questions that have been coming in. No, the, another point I I like to uh, reinforce is a point to Stuart that was on your slide, and that's about uh, character and integrity. Um, one of the things that we learned from uh, our case studies is that. As a leader of an ecosystem, you must have the credibility that you want to have an ecosystem and that it's not a hidden way of uh, trying to build an, uh, a supply chain. Uh, we actually wrote a number of case studies that we don't use in the book uh, because at CEO level, these companies were declaring we are going to build an ecosystem to do this or to innovate in that way. But then when you see what the actions were, it was all about uh, trying to bring on uh, smaller companies, acquiring them, integrating them with the, within the organization and actually um, yeah, killing the ecosystem uh, by just uh, integrating all the, the players into the company. Um, you need to build up credibility that you actually want to have an ecosystem and that you, it's not a disguised way of doing something else. Actually, I, um, uh, I want to quote uh, something that was said by the uh, uh, by some of our in people that we interviewed at uh, Alibaba, who basically said the most difficult um, challenge for an ecosystem leader is being able to say, no, I'm not going to do this. Because mm -hmm. when you build up an ecosystem and you see that some of your partners are actually not as capable as you are, they bring different information, but perhaps they're not as well managed. It's sort of the temptation to take it over uh, or to do it yourself and saying the, the, the ability to say no to opportunities and let, let the partners in the ecosystem um, uh, evolve, uh, develop themselves, is actually one of the major characteristics of a good ecosystem leader. The final, point, the final point I want to make is, I come back to what I said about monetizing. Uh, you must make, in the cases that I described, you must make money out of the ecosystem. That's not the case in, an, uh, in a non-profit or that is not the case in a government organization which has their own goals to achieve. But when you look at business ecosystems, there is a moment where you say, do I get my fair value out of, it, out of this? And so as an ecosystem leader, you need to find that little, we call it a sort of a keystone, the thing that keeps the whole uh, couple together 
in a, in a church or whatever, the keystone, you must have that small thing that is actually essential to the, um, to the ecosystem. And that helps you to become, uh, yeah, the leader, but also the, the person that can actually make money out of the ecosystem. Okay, well, let's, let's throw it over. Before I do, I must just reflect. You sounded like a parent with a child, but you have to let the child grow. And I think the only thing probably as a parent you have as a keystone is, is cash, probably. <laughs> and that's another thought. Kevin, I know we've had a few questions and thoughts in. Can I let you... Um, um, yeah, please. please interest um, people? <clears throat> let's start with, with Tim, Tim Riches. Uh, Tim, I'm going to allow you to talk. You may need to unmute locally, but Tim, you had a point about individuals in the, in, in the organisation. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, fine. Thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, so I'm Tim Richards. We're working on uh, learning ecosystems through the Cities of Learning project uh, with the Royal Society of the Arts and City and Guild uh, in the UK. And um, it's been a really fascinating discussion um, and interesting that people are defining ecosystems in very different ways. But one thing really comes to mind for me, and everyone's talking about very, very different ways of working. Uh, for example, moving from transactional ways of working to working collaboratively. And given that the individual is the kind of smallest part of an ecosystem, how important would you say inner transformation is? Um, and how does that inner transformation come about? And what kind of characteristics do you think we need to develop as individuals in order to create successful um, ecosystems. And if I can just put an add, uh, add on to that, Tim, forgive me, but I, I think also the leadership, how easy is it for the individual leader to change would be, would be mm. interesting. So who, who can pick that up for us, please? Well, I mean, in, in a sense, the, the ability of individuals to change uh, is, is critical to this. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to blow it straight back out to a macro issue uh, from the from the micro, uh, which is that um, the, these uh, virtual organisations uh, that I describe are often most effective in times of volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity in times of VUCA. And um, people who can deal with uh, that are people who are able to grow, uh, particularly in leadership. Um, and uh, this, this is also where uh, the governance comes in uh, because we're moving from uh, clarity through curiosity to courage. And, and that's an enormous personal growth for many leaders, uh, especially as they're also simultaneously moving from a, a task orientation, what I might call a, a, a generation one uh, leadership role, into uh, a relationship. Uh, role of, of uh, governance. So uh, uh, the, the, the growth of the individual um, uh, as leader is important, but, but these, these things have network leaders right across uh, in every part uh, 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 of, of the organization. Uh, and anywhere which becomes uh, deadened by uh, uh, the, the past, uh, is is going to become a, a dysfunctional part of the um, uh, of, of the extended enterprise of the virtual organisation. Just, just to comment on that, um, maybe the, not the individual, but you talked about leaders, uh, Richard. Uh, it's very clear that the people that we saw leading effectively uh, um, ecosystems were people that believed very strongly in collaborative leadership. Uh, Tim used the word collab collaboration. It's really about uh, collaborative le leadership. Uh, it's also people that can lead beyond that organization, that can build consensus and ensure that a wide group of peers take ownership, uh, that are active networkers uh, who can become a trusted source of knowledge. And um, uh, others have written about the ambidextrous uh, leader. Uh, they probably need to be able to live with the dilemmas and not always making sh sure that they solve the trade-offs, but you keep on living with the trade-offs yes. and you have that ambidexterity that is needed uh, to work in an, uh, a network like an ecosystem. I like that description. Yeah, yeah. and in fact, it's interesting. I mean, everyone says share your vulnerabilities, but people are often scared to do it. And I think that there is, it, it may well be that COVID has changed the tone of that. Oh, let's see. 
Um, Jim Dutton, uh, you posted a comment. I wonder if you want to share it to the group. Uh, Can you hear me? On oh, yeah, no, sorry, Vera, please do come in, yeah. We are going through, I mean, there's obviously that three crises happening right now. I think obviously the, the health crisis, of course, as we all know, the economic crisis, and then <laughs> the mental health crisis. And I think this is really essential to uh, to keep in mind, like it just said, Stuart, vulnerability, showing vulnerability is key. And we definitely have learned that during um, during this uh, health pandemic right now. It's mm -hmm. in resilience, not Tim, to your question about leadership. Um, obviously, we're you know practicing against the backdrop of intense challenges that are not stopping, and it's quite tough, you know, for us as individuals being you know <laughs> against this strategy, if you like, the whole time. So, for leaders, I think what I have seen from organizations that have performed well in this time, I think trust. We'll go back to trust is key, but also transparency. You know, being transparent with your people as a leader is really important. Um, I mean, they're not doing well. They can imagine you're not doing well. And if um, if a leader pretends that everything is fine, it's just wrong. So I think showing vulnerability, transparency, and empathy, I think, is really an important one as well. And we have seen <laughs> performed the best on the governmental level are countries that have shown the most empathy. And I mean, most of them are the ones with female leaders, you know. So <laughs> that's, that's I'm being serious. That's yeah. Yeah. But, you know, hopefully many male leaders can also learn from, you know, female leaders. But no matter what, no matter the gender, I think transparency, being transparent with your people, and also show that you invest in your people is really key right now. Of course, many have to let go of, of uh, employees, but do it, at least, you know, do it with empathy or be transparent about it's key. Thank you. So, Jim, I think you, your mic is open. So do you want to come in and then we'll, we'll have to rattle through this now because we've got, we've got about 15, 16 minutes left. And uh, so, Jim, please. Yes, Stuart. Hi. It was it was just a very quick point. I mean, in fact, it's only reinforcing what has, has now uh, uh, been been said by uh, Vera and others. But the the requirement for absolute clarity of purpose, and not just for the immediate objective, uh, but uh, for the long term goal. Uh, and it's so important that everybody at every level understands what the the implied intent uh, is, uh, so that um, especially in a in an organisation of, of, of uh, separate min mini organizations so everybody understands the overall intent so when something happens that perhaps was not entirely expected they know how to react um, mm -hmm. inevitably uh, you know Stuart inevitably because of my military background I tend to relate these things to uh, uh, to what I know best and uh, I mean that's been a sort of article of faith in the military mm -hmm. for uh, the last 30 or 40 years that everybody must understand uh, higher intent that's really interesting and by the way just to prove this is a global call Jim I know, I know Jim is involved in, in, in Africa. Are you in Africa at the moment, Jim, or are you back in uh, the UK? No, no, sorry to disappoint. I am actually back in UK. I got out of Africa just before they closed the airports there in Kenya because I couldn't move around. So oh, okay. Back soon. Uh, okay. So, Stuart, we, we have a question from Michael Mulroy. Michael, uh, you're, if you wanted to open your mic up, you're, you're live, as it were. Yeah. Or happy. comment. Or comment. You know, you can just make a comment as well. Yeah, I, I'm just coming at this with a slightly different angle from, from the perspective that, um, you know, I, I sit in the corporate where, um, you know, I have relationships with, with a number of service providers and, uh, and I kind of view my, my relationships with those service providers as, a, as, a, as an ecosystem. Um, but I guess my question was, do, you, do we agree that, uh, you know, and, and with mutual value very much at the forefront of my mind, do, do we agree that um, the customer or the client or the end user has to be very much a part of, of the ecosystem and, and, and the thinking around that ecosystem and the clarity of intent? Can I jump in uh, there, Stuart? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. We can just oh. letting you jump in. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, so uh, I, I think the end user is really important in this. Uh, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a, a non-executive director. Uh, it's in a company called Pay.UK, which runs the um, retail banking payment systems, uh, faster payments, backs and check and credit. And um, we, we actually have a, an end user advisory council to make sure that the ultimate customers, who we don't directly touch, as it were, 
are involved in understanding the strategic direction and can influence the strategic direction of what we're doing as we create uh, and manage this ecosystem around payments. So I, I'm, I'm a, uh, an absolute firm believer in the importance of hearing the voice of the end user, the, the ultimate customer. Other panelists, can I just, okay, can I just hold, let's just get a couple more, uh, another comment and then perhaps right back to the panelists to comment on that customer and also the next question. And if you want to comment on what uh, Jim Dutton said, please do too. Ed Wilkinson's also posted. Um, Kevin, do you mind? Yeah, his mic is live, so... If okay, thank you. Ed, do you want to just make your point? Yeah, this is really to, sort of to, to the entire panel. I've been to understand, um, uh, you know, from a leadership perspective, how do you identify team members who possess that sort of ecosystem philosophy? And do you see, you know, a, a value system underpinned by an ecosystem philosophy becoming part of an assessment of future leaders? Mm. So, uh, Arno, you were going to come in, so you've got a, a few questions there. You, Jim's talk about uh, higher purpose, uh, the, the, voice, the voice of the customer and all of this, and, the, and, and this issue, is eco, should ecosystem thinking be part of the assessment of future leaders? Uh, so that's a, that's a big question. Um, two comments. That is, first of all, I wanted to reinforce the point that Richard made by saying that uh, customers or the people for whom you create value, uh, they may be clients or whatever, uh, in different organizations, that they are really that they are really key. Uh, in the cases that we uh, studied in depth, uh, we always saw that a good ecosystem started also with foundation customers, customers who were willing to collaborate with the people in the ecosystem, who had an interesting problem, uh, a, a need for innovation, who were willing to uh, make some resources and some time available to work with the uh, people in the ecosystem or the organizations in the ecosystem. It's really um, uh, key to have a good foundation customer. Now talking about the future, um, I would actually say ecosystems is nothing new. I already said it a, a while ago, the commons in an English town were already an ecosystem. The way that the Javanese in, uh, uh, in Indonesia run their uh, terrace, rice terraces is an ecosystem. Ecosystems are probably a very old way of organizing mm -hmm. collaboration between people. But it sort of disappeared uh, at the end of the 19th and during the 20th century uh, because of uh, economies of scale and growing. And it was very difficult to organize ecosystems because we didn't have good communication systems. The great thing is that that old way of working, which is actually fundamental to how people like to work together with each other, that is actually becoming possible again, because we have now the uh, information and communication technologies that, are, I mean, as we are using now, that allow us to actually build these ecosystems on an international scale. And that's the reason why I think there's an organization for the future. Vera, do you want to come in on that? On oh, no, those questions, that's a powerful point. Yeah, I'd like to comment on the customer points that was raised by um, Michael, I think. Mm. Yeah, I think customer is definitely essential. I think the customer has to be, um, I mean, in the end, no matter what we do, it is for the customer and for the individual, right? Whether it's a startup creating, you know, value, it is for the customer. If it's a startup or a company partnering up with a big corporate, it is for the customer or even a corporate internally with the different organizations. I think the customer has to be, um, you know, in part of this ecosystem 100% and probably even in the center of it together. In my view, the startups are in the center, but they are creating value for the customers and the customers then help the startup grow by showing uh, loyalty and, um, and trust, right? So it's, a, it's really, it's an evolving uh, ecosystem that um, feeds off uh, each other really. So I think um, it's definitely really important. Uh, perhaps I can add uh, a thought on the uh, long-term uh, development of people, uh, which is that, uh, of course, it's, it's vital uh, that people are uh, helped to understand this mode of thinking uh, in, within organizations, within participants. Um, and uh, it, it, it's not always natural thinking in the way uh, that some of our education systems work, uh, the collaborative and, and working across uh, between teams, not just within teams. 
um, mm. uh, and, and various uh, earlier points about empathy, uh, which I see has has raised some interesting challenges on, on the on on the chat, uh, is is absolutely critical. Whether it's coming from males or females or or, or any other uh, uh, non-genderist perspective, um, but uh, we we uh, are, are working with uh, the idea that training our leaders is absolutely core to making this whole ecosystem thinking work. Um, and then once we've trained our own leaders, working through the leadership of our, our partner organizations. But do you think Ed's, point, Ed's question, just quickly, Ed's question was, would you recommend perhaps that this becomes part of the assessment of future leaders, that this, um, these characteristics? It, if you if you want it to work ultimately it has to be part of the assessment yeah. I'm, I'm not a, a total believer in in uh, what gets measured gets done uh, because i think other things get done because of cultural reasons as well uh, but i do believe that the assessment and the promotion uh, and the recruitment of, of people will very much be around their ability to work across uh, I I complex organizations as well as being able to uh, to develop their own deep uh, specialisms. Do any of you guys, uh, Arno, if everyone come back in on that, and that question, or should we move on to another oh. question that's coming? Um, maybe you should take another question. Uh, okay. Well, I saw Martin Proctor's made a point, and Martin, I don't know if you want to make that point. Yeah, uh, you're live, uh, Martin, if you want to unmute and speak. Yeah, sure, yeah. So the, the point that I was making is that um, I've had some experience with ecosystems that can work really effectively and people kind of sit there feeling very nervous about whether everyone will actually stick to it as the ecosystem develops and flourishes and value starts to get built. I think the ones that work is where there is really deep trust at a very almost families and friends type level. Mm -hmm. The ones where you're kind of wary that someone's going to make a break and suddenly realize they can get an advantage and dash off and do their own thing. I think are, are the ones that don't work so well. And so that deep trust is, is a complicated one. How can you really assess that your ecosystem partners are going to exhibit that deep trust all the way through the journey and the life cycle of the, uh, of the system, do you think? Well, let, well let, guys, I'm gonna to come to you because we're gonna wrap up and we'll give you all a minute. Uh, one, if I can say, Martin, from the point of view of mutual value, uh, we think this is, a, along with everyone else, this is a really critical factor and actually uh, goes to the heart of it and there needs to be accountabilities for behaviors in the system that you agree up front there's just a thought on that which is and, and therefore if, if they if you're not behaving in accordance with the characteristics you've identified then that gets called out and 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 it has to be and bravery and courage and honesty are key principles that have to be in that if and it's interesting i'll come back to you if i can skip to any final thoughts but this plays into your idea that it's kind of the English village now writ large, that we're now potentially, or, you know, potentially all part of an English village that we can design, you know, uh, uh, where, where if you didn't behave accord, according to certain principles in the old English village, you, you had to live with these people. So you, you were called <laughs> out. Any thoughts on that on us to finish off with the kind of key principles that people need to apply? The, the, the three elements that I would give, I actually fully agree that one needs to build trust and that that's not an easy uh, thing to do. Having said that, the large organizations that we study show that you can build actually that trust, even though you're not necessarily friends and family living together. Uh, you can build it on an international scale. I would sort of highlight three things. That is, first of all, um, the credibility of the uh, ecosystem leader and whether he or she, and I'm not going to go into the gender of this, uh, but whether he or she is actually willing to build an ecosystem and taking the responsibility for it. Secondly, it is also about building very good interfaces between the partners. Um, communicating is difficult. Communicating um, tacit know-how and uh, values is even more difficult. You need to actually build very good interfaces, very good uh, communication systems. And the third one is, of course, you need, and that goes back to Rich's point about uh, governance, you need to have the guts to penalize bad behavior. Um, uh, there, there needs to be systems to get rid of the people that would actually uh, free ride on the ecosystem and not contribute to it. And actually, you can see that 
people like Alibaba, Dassault Systems uh, are actually are practicing this. They find ways of governing the system and uh, ensuring that uh, free riders are uh, thrown out. Thank you. Vera, uh, closing thoughts, please. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to say, obviously, I did not want to make this agenda debate. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's good. It's, it's important. The facts of you know, the countries that have been reported as the most efficient, like Germany, you know, Angela Merkel, New Zealand, have been, uh, are the ones that are being led by female leaders. So this is just a fact. Um, another one, um, to Arnold's point, English Village, I think it's actually interesting. We might even be almost going back to being like, so much more local, you know, once we can travel again, whenever that happens, I don't plan to hop on a plane and go to a big conference again, like I used to do every two weeks, you know, before until like end of January in Davos. So um, I think we are going to be much more local. So I see it's like a physical localization, global digitalization approach, you know, so we'll be much more uh, local, we'll be supporting local economies, local restaurants that, you know, many are going out of business. And we'll be connecting much more that way, you know, digitally. You know, many corporates will realize there is no need to spend so much money on sending, you know, your consultants to, you know, on a, a business class, five-star hotels, trips. So you can do this digitally, of course. You know, we do all need some human interaction sometimes, but I do see this approach of almost like a village of being local and um, connected uh, you know, globally, digitally. Thank you. So local ecosystem and a global ecosystem coming in parallel. Uh, Richard, if you don't mind in a minute, I'm really sorry, but a minute of final thoughts would be very grateful. So uh, here we are living in this uh, world of VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. Uh, and, and we're living it uh, real time and really big. I think we're going to see uh, supply chains shorten dramatically, uh, at least for a period of time. Uh, as people build up resilience within their organizations. And that's going to be within their virtual organizations as well as within their physical organizations. Uh, but all of this is predicated entirely upon having shared values, making the shared values work across the ecosystem and getting the right governance structures in place. Unless you get the governance structures in place, none of this will work. Thank and you. It's less than a minute. No, brilliant. Well done. Just very briefly for me before I hand over Kevin, just to, to wrap up. Um, I, I think we, we definitely heard this variety of perspectives on the same core idea. And I think, Arno, your comparison with almost going back to the way things used to be done, but leveraging modern technology and Vera thinking, doing that on a global level as well as on a local level. I think these are really powerful ideas that apply to almost all, so all different contexts, public, private, uh, um, and, and everything at charities, everything in between. So it's been really interesting. Kevin, I, I'd love to ask you perhaps just to, to wrap us up. Well, uh, first of all, thank, let me thank everybody who has participated, but even if you were just listening, but those who've also made questions and comments, been really uh, powerful. I'd also like to thank the three um, uh, wonderful guests we've had on today who, who shared their thinking so freely. Um, the common thing that's come out of it for me has been uh, the need to build trust, the need to stop short-term thinking, the need for leaders to take a different role. And we've had great insights from all three folks. Next week, we take this on. Uh, we're going to look specifically at infrastructure procurement. Uh, although the lessons from this, I believe, are, are, are go across so many industry groups. And we have yet more amazing participants. Tony Meggs, uh, who is currently chairman of Crossrail, the largest uh, civil engineering project, I think, for some time in the UK. He's also ex chief executive of the Infrastructure and Projects Authority. So he's overseen many of the biggest projects in government. Secondly, we have uh, Jeremy Beaton. We all know London 2012 was a wonderful success. It didn't happen by accident. Jeremy drove that operation. Then we have um, uh, Nick Bliss, managing partner, former managing partner, infrastructure at Freshfields. He's advised the government and Chris Lewis, who's active in many of these projects as energy and infrastructure leader. Fantastic guys who are going to share their experience of what they believe need, needs to change. If there's been anything that's come from this or you'd like to talk to us further, those are our contact details. We've been excited to share this thinking with you. Thank you. And do come along at 11 o'clock next week uh, on Thursday to hear from those great speakers. Thank you again. Have a great day.